Good morning. I'm Marsha Levy, and I'm the Executive Director of Volunteers of Legal Service. In October, VALS invited an amazing group of people from the legal service, law firm, in-house legal department, and law school world to discuss the question of the alignment of pro bono and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives to better serve our communities. Out of these discussions came the VALS Leadership Summit, originally planned for March 11, 2020. We held the opening plenary last week with an amazing panel of speakers led by Paula Edgar, and we are pleased to be offering panels one and two today. We want to thank our sponsors, the Association of Pro Bono Council, APCO, PIPA, the Association of Law Firm and Diversity Professionals, the Association of Corporate Pro Bono, and the New York City Bar Association and Thomson Reuters Social Impact Institute and West Legal Education Center, and the amazing Lara Shea, Senior Editor, Practical Law, Thomson Reuters, and Vols Partner at every step of the way. In a COVID-19 world, we've seen the disparate impact of the virus on communities of color and the economically disadvantaged. The racial and social disparities have only become more so in our consciousness as a result of the murder of black men and women at the hands of the police and the protests and treatment of protesters that has followed. Both have created challenges, but also opportunities for the legal community. The VALS Leadership Summit opened last week with a facilitated discussion focused on the ways to overcome the effects of separating pro bono and DEI initiatives within organizations and the benefits and the challenges of aligning them. The panels today will take a deeper dive into these issues. And on June 24th from 6.30 to 7.30 at night, there will be another conversation, a timely conversation between women leaders in pro bono, facilitated by Michelle Coleman Mays, the Vice President and General Counsel of the New York Public Library, and the honorees, Sheila Boston, a partner at Arnold and Porter and the new president of the New York City Bar Association, Betsy Plevin, a partner at Proskauer and a past president of the New York City Bar Association, and Kate O'Leary at the General Electric Company. I want to introduce now Jessica Penkoff, Ball staff attorney in our Elderly Project and Veterans Initiative, who, along with Ball staff Sarah Efron and John Grabel Herman, helped to conceive of, shape, plan, and carry out this summit. Jessica? Thanks, Marsha. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jess Penkoff. As Marsha said, I'm a staff attorney with the Elderly Project and the Veterans Initiative at Falls. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things and then turn it over for our first panel. Our agenda is posted on the screen. Um, we're going to have panel one followed by breakout groups. Um, Thompson Reuters will put us all into breakout rooms where we can um, have some discussions amongst um, ourselves and take some notes. And then we'll be sharing takeaways from those breakout group sessions um, when we all come back together. Um, and then there will be a break uh, right at 11.15 for 15 minutes. And then we'll get into panel two. And at the end, Marsha will sign us off and we'll be done around 12.45. Um, so I just want to give you guys a little bit of information about the breakout groups. Uh, when we are put into those groups, please be sure to activate your microphone. Um, there's already one person in each room that's been designated to take notes and email your takeaways to me. I'll be compiling everyone's takeaways um, and sharing them with Susan so that Susan and the panelists can do a quick debrief at the end. Um, some ground rules for engagement in the breakout groups, and I want to thank Molly Co. She's our um, Immigration Project Senior Staff Attorney for sharing these with us. Um, with the exceptions of the takeaways we share with each other, our conversations in breakout groups should be private. Um, the breakout group sessions will not be recorded. Um, let's be respectful of each other and not make assumptions about other people's experiences. Um, and lastly, I'd like to remind everyone to stay hydrated. Um, I also want to call your attention to the files tab in the new row classroom where we've posted an article by David Lash called The Overlooked Importance of Pro Bono, which is really one of the, the earliest articles we could find about the intersection between these two topics. Um, it's really good background reading, um, and so I'd encourage you guys all to read it. And thank you to David for allowing us to make that part of our materials. 
Um, second to last, we have a hashtag for this event. It's on the slide here. It's hashtag Vols Pro Bono DEI. Please feel free to post about the event throughout the morning um, on your social media accounts, and please use that hashtag if you do. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'll introduce our first panel. The panelists are Aisha Green, Director of Attorney Development and Training at Cadwallader, Wickersham and Taft. Annie Mohan, Manager of Pro Bono at Cadwallader. We also have Kevin Kernan, who's a partner and the founding director of the Public Service Project at Stroop, Stroop and Levon, and Christopher Auguste, who's a partner, chair of the Diversity Committee, and co-chair of the Pro Bono Committee at Kramer, Levin, Neftalis, and Frankel. And moderating, moderating the panel today is Susan Sturm. Susan is the George M. Jaffin Professor of Law and Social Responsibility at Columbia Law School. She founded the Center for Institutional and Social Change, where she leads collaborative action research projects with institutional and community leaders in the areas of education, criminal justice, and community development. As part of this work, Susan has developed a curriculum for building leadership capacity to address race and bias within the Massachusetts trial court system. And so we're really excited to have Susan moderating today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Susan. It's great to be with you all. Uh, it's great to be part of a conversation that is inviting people to be reflective about how we can take up responsibility at a time like this. Um, the, as Marsha has said, uh, this is a time that's really heightened our attentiveness to the issues that are, lie at the intersection of pro bono and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this panel and this entire conference rests on the assumption that this is really important to do. Uh, so it's, I just want to briefly, very briefly highlight the reasons it's really important. This is really the premise on which this panel will, will be based. First of all, uh, the opening plenary called very strongly for the importance of what panelists referred to as cultural humility. Uh, and others have referred to as racial literacy or cultural literacy. And it's widely understood uh, that it's so important for the lawyers that are doing pro bono work where there really is a gap in the identities and backgrounds often of the lawyers who are doing the work and the clients they are representing to learn how to interact with this uh, form of cultural humility and racial literacy. Uh, and so that is one clear place of integration. Uh, and uh, it's also, that discussion also uh, highlighted the disparities between the racial and socioeconomic composition of the legal profession and of those who are likely to be represented um, in pro bono cases. Uh, a second reason that our panelists laid out in, in uh, really uh, setting up this panel has to do with the importance of uh, attracting and retaining lawyers of color, women and first generation lawyers. So many of them, and I see this firsthand in my classes on lawyering for change and among law students and graduates, so many of them went into law in order to have an impact on the communities that they care about. Many of them are also going to be working in law firms and the prospect of retaining all of this talent, attracting and retaining them really depends on the capacity of firms to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion with pro bono. And finally, uh, the legitimacy of the legal profession, uh, in especially in a time like this, where the disparities have really taken on a kind of amplified visibility. Uh, the capacity of the legal profession to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion, and pro bono into the core of the work uh, that law firms are doing uh, has just received added attention. There's a kind of groundswell of uh, interest and demand that predominantly white institutions, including law firms, uh, take up in a really visible and accountable way the challenges of integrating diversity, equity and inclusion, and pro bono into the core work of the legal profession. The panelists, we have a wonderful group of panelists, the panelists that you're going to be hearing from uh, have all really committed substantial parts of their professional lives to making this kind of integration. And what they are going to lead us in is something that's really important, uh, which is how do we do it? 
how do firms do it? How have firms done this? Uh, and so there's a lot to be learned from their experiences and reflections. Let me just also remind everyone that you're going to have an opportunity in the breakout uh, discussions to really dig in to how what you're about to hear relates to your own experience. So I want to encourage you to be taking notes and reflecting as you um, as you listen, uh, because you will be invited to brainstorm and bring your own experiences to bear when we when we move into the breakout groups. So uh, let's start with uh, the stru structure and relationship between pro bono and diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in your organizations, and with the question of how is this actually being done in your firm or corporation? How is uh, the um, pro bono diversity, equity, and inclusion program structured to facilitate this kind of integration. Uh, and Christopher, why don't we start with you? Sure. Happy to, to do so. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I think I'm in a pretty, my firm is in a pretty fortunate position because I'm actually co-chair of the pro bono committee and chair of the diversity committee. And while that happened to, to a certain extent by happenstance, because I was already the uh, chair of the, um, the diversity committee, but when we decided to restructure the, the pro bono committee, we thought it was important that we get um, someone like myself who's uh, involved in the diversity committee on, on the uh, pro bono committee. But also even before we had this sort of joining in, to a certain extent of, of my being on both committees, I mean, there was already interaction. For, uh, for instance, um, the whole issue of know your rights came out of the diversity committee, and that from that we we went to the pro bono committee and said, how do we get this out there in terms of training, going to to public high schools to train people? But the genesis of it was actually in the um, in the, the diversity committee. So I think from from our perspective, uh, we have uh, let me just say structurally on our diversity committee, we have partners. Uh, uh, and associates, as well as um, head of different staffing departments. And the, the importance of that is I think we want an, a broad-based sort of view on the issues of diversity. But more importantly, we look at diversity as the way how do we train our colleagues about the issue of diversity. And the nexus with, um, um, with pro bono became a natural sort of connection um, and in fact, just recently with, with all the uh, protests and the issues we are facing now, members of the diversity committee say, what can the firm do? And in fact, what we have done with, and it's really, uh, this program is formed by the pro bono committee, but a genesis actually came out of the diversity committee was to form a racial justice initiative where we're gonna focus on cases that address from a pro bono standpoint, um, um, racial justice. So I'll, I'll stop there so that some of my other colleagues can, on the board, panel can speak. Great. So we're hearing some really great ideas like overlapping representation on the two committees and using projects that lie at the intersection of both uh, to facilitate this kind of integration. Kevin, do you want to jump in here and add what your firm is doing? Sure. Happy to. Um, and, and I'll start with two brief points. One is that um, although with Stroke, I've been doing this for uh, 20 years, I, I don't think I've ever felt more um, humbled by, by the challenges that we face or confused about how we got to this particular juncture. And so um, I just think out of, uh, honestly, sensitivity to my own feelings and also I think maybe to our audience feel a lot of sadness around this discussion that um, the world around us is in such a disarray and um, a state of really unsustainable inequities. And I think that frames this for me and, and I think probably for a lot of us here today. Secondly, Strook is, was founded in 1886. We're, we're a very old firm. And I think that's important for reasons that'll come up later. Secondly, we have about only 300 lawyers, so we are a small, big firm. And I think that's relevant to folks who are trying to figure out what works at my shop. Uh, it's different having 1,200 lawyers to 300. I think that's an important part of how you size your pieces and how you fit them together. There are things you can get away with at a smaller firm that you can at a larger, and 
and vice versa. There are resources you might have at a larger firm that you don't have at a smaller firm. And that's, we have to think about this as business people within our firms. What will succeed within the business of the firm? Not just what do we want to achieve because we aspire to these better outcomes. Having said that, the, stru the, the structure at firm at Strook is simple. I run our public service project. On the other hand, we have a head of um, talent and inclusion. So we have two directors, a pro bono director and a DEI director. I sit on our diversity and inclusion committee. So we are at, talking at least once a month formally. Other than that, Yakiri Adal, who is our, our director of DEI, uh, inclusion and talent, and I speak informally all the time, exchanging articles, talking about uh, development at the firm, talking about specific attorneys at the firm whom we think might need uh, our attention, our help, or whom we would like to bring into what we do because they can help us do it better. And in addition to that, we have our affinity groups, which are, are a feeder to both the pro bono practice and the diversity practice of a lot of important ideas that we wouldn't come up with on our own, frankly. And the broader the discussion, the better. So our affinity groups, whether it's attorneys of color or uh, community um, involvement or working families or women attorneys, are a great way for us to broaden our base, be better informed, more sensitive, and, and not take for granted that we have the idea just because we're tasked with coming up with the answers. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin. We're hearing uh, additional layering on here, the importance of tailoring this integration to the context of the firm, to the size of the firm. We're hearing about the importance of having contact and interaction between people who have primary responsibility for pro bono and diversity and, and uh, equity and inclusion. We're hearing the importance of integrating this with the business case, what makes this important to the firm's um, business and uh, sense of what's important. Uh, we heard the importance of individualized attention, reaching out to individuals to integrate them in the work. And we've also heard the importance of building on groups that already exist in the firm, such as affinity groups that will uh, help the firm generate ideas and integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion with pro bono. Uh, so we'd love to add um, now uh, uh, Aisha and uh, Annie, uh, to, who are both uh, with Cadwallader. So um, Aisha, do you wanna, I don't know, you may have an idea of which one of you would like to go first. Uh, so I'll leave that to, to you. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Aisha Green. I am not a partner at Cadwallader. I serve in the administrative role as the Director of Attorney Development and Training. And in that role, I oversee a few departments of the firm, our attorney training, performance management, pro bono, and diversity, because we consider all of these things to be sort of tied in together. So in that role, I serve on the hiring committee um, for recruiting. I also serve on the diversity committee and the pro bono committee and also the training committee. Annie Mohan is the firm's manager of pro bono and she reports directly to me as does the firm's manager of diversity and inclusion. I think this is critically important because it helps tie everything together and does not segment anything out. Our meetings are, we have weekly meetings where all of the departments meet together to discuss ideas. And that's just our formal meeting, but generally we meet. Um, Annie attends affinity network meetings in her role as the pro bono manager and the diversity manager is participates in a lot of our pro bono initiatives as well. It's a lot of cross population. So I'm going to share that, you know, it's probably no uh, surprise to everyone watching today that at law firms, there is a critical issue regarding retaining, training, and providing leadership development opportunities for diverse attorneys, despite all the efforts that have been made. So we like to tie everything in. We think everything is critical to help train, retain, and develop diversity leaders. And so we do that through our pro bono efforts as well. They're all tied together. So I think a little bit later on, we'll talk about our pro bono clinic model, which matches diversity, um, diverse attorneys who were interested in pro bono matters 
to creating sort of mini practice groups that focus on pro bono initiatives. And the pro bono clinics give people the opportunity to be trained, to have exposure throughout the firm, and for leadership opportunities. But I think we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. Okay. Annie, would you like to jump in here? Annie's having trouble hearing you, Susan. She only hears static, but if Annie wants to say anything else, she can hear everyone else fine. So if Annie wants to jump in, she may want to jump in a little bit later and talk about the pro bono clinics, but um, if she wants to say anything else, now is a great time. Annie, can you hear me? Great. Yeah, I'm having trouble seeing and hearing Susan. So um, I'm working with Jess to try to figure it out. If anyone else is having trouble, sorry about that, Annie. And if anyone else is having trouble, please let me know. So see if there's anything I can do on my end. Uh, so uh, Aisha, would you ask Annie if she wants to say anything now? Anything, anything further you wanted to add to what I said? So I, I do agree that being able to have consistent and ongoing conversations with our diversity and inclusion team is um, one of the reasons that our integration of our programs has been so successful. Um, and I understand that firms, you know, do it differently and um, the departments are completely siloed. And whether or not, you know, firms are integrating programs, I do think there's so much value in just having conversations with each other and being aware of what each um, each other's doing in their um, programs. Great. So we're hearing the introduction of additional strategies. First of all, we've heard uh, the, uh, an approach of using a staffing model that has a full-time person who is uh, working with the leaders in the firm to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion into major aspects of decision making. And also we've heard the introduction of um, a project and clinic focus, which we'll hear more about, but that will actually integrate pro bono and diversity, equity, inclusion considerations by inviting people to do social justice projects. Uh, and uh, this also sounds a little bit like what Christopher was talking about uh, in what's going on in his firm. Uh, so it all sounds so easy and straightforward in the way that you're describing this now, but we all know that this is actually quite challenging to do, generally speaking, because of all of the ways in which firms are structured and also because of the press of uh, of uh, of day to day work, and those challenges have only been accentuated along with the urgency under current conditions, working remotely, and also with the increased need uh, and visibility of these kinds of issues. Uh, so, uh, we'd love to get your thoughts now about the how, what are some of the challenges uh, that your organizations are facing as you're trying to not only do this work for the people who get it and the people who really want to do it, uh, but also really to make this something that's valued uh, throughout the firm uh, and that uh, people will feel integrated and rewarded for doing this work, um, particularly when it comes to things like uh, promotion, recognition being valued uh, in the firm. So um, why don't we go in reverse order now? So do you want, to, should we start now with um, Aisha and Annie? Uh, and Aisha, if you speak first and then invite Annie to speak when you're done in case Annie can't hear me, that would be great. Sure. So we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges and I'm repeating so that Annie can hear everyone. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges um, and how to kind of get there and the strategies to get there. Um, so, you know, of course the challenge is when firms are not integrated and when people are not, or when things are siloed, that people are not sharing information, right? So I think that it's critically important no matter how the organization is structured, is to have very, um, not informal, but formal meetings, formal conversations to talk about ways to structure. So for us, you know, um, because we work together, it forces us to think about ways that there are cross sections. So in 2005, the Pro Bono Institute um, 
created a white paper and it was on the synergy of the intersection of diversity and pro bono. And one of the things that it said that we thought was critically important is that um, minority recruits, and this is something that Susan talked about earlier, their life experiences have created an atmosphere where they feel very connected to serving um, underserved minority communities. But many of them, you know, they go to big law firms. So they're looking for a way to be engaged, to be activated. So I think the first thing you need to do is to have hard data, right? What are you trying to achieve because your organization is going to want to know a little bit about hard data? So we did a little bit of research at our firm and not by person, but purely by hours, we found that the Pro Bono Institute was correct, that the majority of the hours in Pro Bono were done by our diverse attorneys. Um, all of our attorneys engaged in pro bono, but in terms of hours, more hours were done by diverse attorneys. But we we're also seeing that diverse attorneys needed support with having great connections to mentors, training. They needed to be retained and they needed leadership opportunities. And so that being a challenge, we had to next think about how do we get the mentors? How do we get them leadership opportunities? How do we set them up for promotion? And so then the, the idea of the pro bono clinic model is kind of what came up. And Annie will now talk about the pro bono clinic model. Thanks, Aisha. So uh, before I uh, begin, I just wanted to emphasize that this was not another thing that we were assigning to our diverse associates. We know they are. Um, you know, selected for various functions at the firm. And this is actually the opposite. It was something that they wanted to see instituted at the firm. Um, so our model, um, and I'm going to be referring to our Cadwallader Black and Latino Association, CBLA. We love our acronyms at Cadwallader. Um, so our CBLA Immigration Clinic is one of our first clinics and was launched about five years ago. And um, the immigration clinic really is an in-house support system for any of our attorneys who are working on um, pro bono immigration matters or interested in working on immigration pro bono matters. And it's comprised of multiple resources to help engender that confidence and ability of all our attorneys to be involved in um, you know, pro bono immigration work. So the clinic has developed um, a discipline and process-driven model to enhance communication and information sharing amongst all our attorneys. And like Aisha mentioned earlier, operates similarly to a mini practice group. So there are layers of leadership. Um, there's a partner sponsor, an associate leadership committee who volunteered um, to direct the clinic's activities. And the clinic also has a firm approved annual budget, not for case related expenses, but for covering you know, any resources that they may need um, for hosting clinic branded events and relevant topics and for hosting um, re regular quarterly meetings um, for, all, for all attorneys, not just those that are working on immigration cl um, clinic matters or those that are, I, I'm getting some static. I think Susan may be chiming in. No, nope. she's not. Okay, so I'll keep going. Um, so at, as I mentioned at the quarterly meetings, all our attorneys are invited to attend. Again, it's very inclusive and not just um, selective in that the work that's being done and the events that are being held are limited to the attorneys who are um, in our Cadwallader Black and Latino, Latino Association. The clinic has built out a shared um, repository of immigration related knowledge that includes filing tips, uh, brief structures, hearing procedures, court rulings, and much more. And now recognizing that there's strength in numbers, the clinic has now expanded to embark on joint projects with our with external partners, such as in-house counsel and uh, some of our nonprofit legal services providers, who, um, as you know, themselves are increasingly strained. So um, that's sort of the uh, nuts and bolts of the um, clinic model here at Cadwallader. So I will turn it back over to Susan. Hopefully I answered the questions asked. Great, and I think we're, we're hearing uh, partly a response to something that was raised in the opening plenary uh, that the panelists were really kind of struggling with is how do you provide feedback to lawyers that may not be engaged in culturally sensitive or culturally 
uh, literate interactions with clients and uh, also uh, how do you actually uh, address a real problem in a way that will really have impact. And we're hearing one response to that is to create ongoing relationships between senior and junior lawyers, such that that kind of feedback about everything, but specifically around issues related to uh, cultural literacy uh, can be addressed. And the uh, building long-term partnerships with organizations uh, where you can actually meet those needs. Uh, so uh, I'm just to uh, both, both Kevin and Christopher, in the interest of time, um, if you could include in your remarks um, something about where you want to go from here, and then we'll circle back to Aisha and Annie about that uh, so that you each get to address that. Uh, so Kevin, do you want to talk a little bit about barriers, how you're addressing them, and kind of a, a sentence or two about where we go from here? Sure. And I'll start with the barriers because I think those are easier to identify than where we go from here. And the barriers that, that we see, and I, I spoke with Yakiri about this many times, are threefold. Resources, billable hours, and client development. Resources. It's not a nice thing or a necessary or a good thing at a firm to have a DEI practice. It's not a nice thing to have a pro bono practice. It's an essential thing and it has to be funded and resourced like, an, like essential functions of the firm. Anything else is a compromise. Billable hour. It's the start and end literally of every big firm lawyer's day and it shapes consciously or unconsciously how we work. If we don't recognize DEI and pro bono efforts at the highest levels, then we are saying something to our attorneys about how we value them as a firm. So time devoted to diversity, time devoted to pro bono should be treated like time devoted to billable. And that it's a difficult equation for every firm to work out for itself, but it should be thinking about it very hard. Third, client development it is more important than ever. It's whispered and shouted into the ear again of every attorney that we have from the moment they come into the firm. It's a complex thing these days, and it can mean different things for attorneys of color. It can mean different things for our attorneys who are women. It can mean very different things for attorneys who are women of color. And how do we talk about it to the firm and create opportunities for our diverse attorneys that are meaningful and serious and don't simply say, develop a client base? That might be like, learn a new language while you're devoting 12 hours to your billable work. Good luck. Okay, those are the challenges um, on a higher note, although frankly, those, those challenges are opportunities. Let's be realistic. On a higher note, I think, wh where do we go from here, Susan? Um, deeper innovation, number one, and number two, a more youthful face on all of these efforts at the firm. I, I don't fit the bill anymore of a youthful face, and I could benefit from having more attorneys, younger attorneys, um, integrated and activated uh, and recognized at our firm, not, only, not as recipients of these efforts, but as drivers of these efforts. And so youth is uh, where we go from here. And I, uh, that la on that last point, Kevin, I'm, I'm seeing how important it is for us to be lifting up the leadership of, um, of new lawyers, lawyers who are really the future and the ones who are going to be faced with solving all of these issues, not only uh, in law firms, but also these really tough issues that are facing our democracy. So, uh, and I guess the challenge, all the challenges that you laid out, Kevin, uh, are challenges that uh, challenges that every firm is going to have to face. Uh, so, Christopher, uh, 
uh, I hope you're hearing me. Uh, and uh, if not, if someone else could repeat that, it's Christopher, it's your, you're on to uh, share both the barriers that you have seen and also where you wanna go from here. Christopher, are you with us? It looks like you may have dropped out, Susan. Okay, so while we're waiting for Christopher to join us, why don't we circle back to Aisha and Annie and see if there's something that you would want to add here in terms of uh, where we go from here. You've talked about some strategies that your firm has been engaged in, and now we are uh, we're facing uh, both the challenges that Kevin laid out uh, that have been with us, and then uh, always uh, uh, the challenge that we're facing with this with this new moment, which is also creating opportunities. Because, as I heard from several of my former students, people in law firms who have never raised these issues before are saying, "Wait a minute! It's silence is not enough. We need to take action." We don't know how to have these conversations. We don't know how to do this, but we can't just sit sit back. We really have to do something. So it seems like a real opportunity on both the diversity, equity, inclusion, and on the pro bono front, even as firms are also faced with these daunting challenges. So uh, where do you think we should go from here? The question is, where do we go from here? And I saw Christopher's uh, square light up. So I'm going to ask Christopher, are you here? Because I do want to give him an op opportunity if he's back. Okay, so where do we go from here? I think courageous conversations is step one, and we're doing that a lot. We have to move away from courageous conversation to actually taking action. If people are not already engaged in thinking about these topics with management, they should be doing so. If they are already not working together and collaboratively with other departments, they should be doing so. I come from a mindset where all of us are gatekeepers for diversity, equity, inclusion. It does not matter what your title is. It does not matter what your job is. It does not matter what your role is. If you are in recruiting, if you're in training, if you're in development, if you're in programming, your job is to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think that the next step is take action, to step back and think, how in my role can I take a hand and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so that's what we do, you know, in our department is, you know, we all have our jobs, but how are we all thinking about it from the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And how can we all take a step and take a role in that? And actually mapping out a concrete action plan, sharing that action plan, discussing it, um, having retreats, and talking about what are the next things that we can do and how can we implement it and let's implement it now. Not tomorrow, but now, how can we do that? Um, so I think the next step after the first courage, courageous conversation mm -hmm. is taking action. Susan, you're muted right now. Uh, uh, Aisha, would you invite Annie to inv add whatever she would like? On the sure. question, where we go from here? Sure. So, Annie or Christopher, either one of you want to add on to what do we do from here? Because I feel like Christopher's screen has changed. Maybe he's around. Uh, out of luck. Uh, Annie, do you want to jump in here? Nothing. Annie, want to? Oh, sorry. Yeah, not, nothing really to add, but, um, you know, I, I just want to encourage folks to rather than, you know, act as referees, really try to play coaches um, for this and to really help to coach their, you know, our diverse attorneys passion into something of purpose. And so part of what I think we're hearing from Kevin, Aisha, and Annie, and that I know Christopher would be saying if he were able to speak based on our conversations beforehand, uh, is that this is uh, really an issue that starts with every person in the firm, 
uh, particularly people in leadership positions, partners, uh, and uh, that actually tackling this question, having these conversations isn't so easy. And as one of the panelists on the opening plenary said, feedback, generally speaking, is a hard thing for, for law firms to do. Uh, and we're hearing here the need for feedback of a kind that can be particularly challenging. Uh, and so the ability to build the capacity and the opportunities and the space for people to talk about firms' uh, responsibilities and capacity to address diversity, equity, inclusion issues, to address issues of race as they come up, to deal with issues of pro bono and all those barriers that we've heard about without people worrying about impacts that this will have on their advancement within the firm. These are all things that will require rolling up one sleeve and actually talking when you don't feel comfortable, talking when you don't have answers, stepping back and listening, and not only um, acting before you actually know what's needed. Uh, so now is an opportunity, and hopefully Christopher will be able to close us out at the end. I'm sorry we haven't been able to hear from him, but now is an opportunity for all of you to go to your breakout rooms and begin to really talk yourselves. We wanted to, it's very important for, uh, for you to know that all of us know that we are not the experts, that we are all people who are struggling with the same issues that you are and that you all have so many ideas about how to do this, about what the challenges are. Probably many of you, we could have uh, flipped and have you up on, on the, in the panel. So this is an opportunity for everyone both to share your thoughts and reactions to uh, what you just heard, but more importantly, to put on the table what you are doing in your own organizations and what you could do to actually move this forward, particularly uh, in the moment that we are in. Um, and so you're, we're uh, offering you uh, two questions in your breakout rooms and the facilitators will be helping to um, really uh, help focus attention on these questions. What did you hear uh, from the speakers uh, that resonated with you? Does your firm or your corporation experience the same kinds of challenges or use some of the same tactics or strategies that were mentioned by the panelists? Do you experience challenges or deploy integration tactics that were not discussed? Where do you think we should go from here? Uh, and so that's the first thing. And then we're gonna ask everyone, uh, every breakout group to identify two or three action items that your firm or corporation will pursue going forward to better integrate your pro bono and diversity, equity, inclusion programs. Uh, at 11 o'clock, we're, we're just gonna be doing a brainstorm at 11 o'clock, someone in your breakout room will share that information uh, back with us so that you can hear what all of these are, ideas are from the various breakout rooms. Uh, and for those last five minutes, you can either return to your conversation or you can use this as an opportunity for you to develop your own kind of personal accountability strategy. What am I going to do to actually address these issues uh, in my firm? So with that, you don't need to do anything. You will be sent to a breakout room with a, with a facilitator, uh, and then we will uh, begin the conversation. So have a good and, and courageous uh, conversation in your breakout rooms. Hi, everyone. We'll be moderating the break. And, yeah, uh, and I think it, uh, um, in terms of what are sort of touch points from our breakout, one of the things I raised that I think is critical is that the they need to have buy-in from senior management. You need to have the, the 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 executive committee of the firm or the managing partners involved. Um, and our uh, diversity committee, the one of the two co-managing partners attends every meeting, and it's necessary to have him there to hear what we're discussing and what the challenges we are facing, so that when he goes back to the executive committee and when the firm makes decisions, that it's it's clear. Um, in addition, we have, with respect to the pro bono side of it, the other co-managing partner is involved and we let him uh, know in terms of what we're doing. So I think without getting that buy-in from the, the top of the firm, and, and if it's not real, I think the associates feel it, they understand it, and, and they will have a negative reaction to it. And I think that's why when this week, a week ago, when people through the diversity committee said we needed to say something or do something. And in fact, I took the position that we couldn't just, like other firms, just say, oh, we care. 
that we had to do something, this whole initiative came about. And I think it's because the, I think our managing partners understand that um, this is part of the firm and we need to address it. So you really need buy-in from the top level. And I think that from my perspective, that's probably the, one of the most critical things. Um, uh, Christopher, is there anything else that you wanna share about um, things that are going on in your firm that will add to the conversation or um, where you wanna go from here before we turn to the breakout groups since you didn't get a chance to speak before? Um, no, I mean, I think really the key is, I think the, the perfect example is, as I said, is our racial justice initiative, where the firm coming together uh, through pro bono, but really led by the, the diversity committee to, to make us, to, to take on cases. And we are already in the process of taking on new matters that address this, the sort of the macro issue of racial justice. And I think when a firm can react that quickly and move that quickly, it's because it matters. And I think that's, uh, and again, I, I go back to the point that, I mean, I had discussions uh, with the co-managing partners, so how, do we, how do we do this and how do we best effectuate it? And what the associates were saying who were emailing us about what we should do. And I think that's critical. So it's a, it's a level of buy-in at the top and, and communications with the associates to say, we care and let's see how we can best address it. So that, that's how I perceive it. Great. Uh, well, uh, just to um, say a, a little bit now, it looks like looking down the themes, there were a lot of commonalities in the theme. I'll just start with, with the group that I uh, was with. Uh, and that group included people who were in-house. Uh, and so one of the things that was uh, an important takeaway was the importance of making explicit the integration between pro bono and diversity uh, when it's been being practiced in some way informally, but it hasn't been made explicit, it hasn't been built into the design, and that there's a real value in naming the integration and structuring it into the firm. We also, a second point was the importance of working from the, from the bottom up and the top down. People use the language of soldiers and leaders and one person talked about having a reverse mentorship program where junior lawyers were mentoring senior lawyers about how to integrate diversity, equity, inclusion and pro bono. And there was also uh, the idea of how to value diverse lawyers more explicitly uh, and to deal with the fact there, that in many organizations they're being asked to do so much uh, in ways that make it really harder for them uh, to thrive in advance. And we're seeing that these are issues that are coming through in a number of the other groups uh, we, we see uh, Molly's group do more to integrate and facilitate partnership into DEI and pro bono teams, uh, which is something that resonated with a bunch of different groups. The importance of adding cultural humility training to substantive trainings. So it's not only a standalone, so it's actually integrated into the way people are learning about their legal practice. Um, have the pro bono team offer to attend affinity group meetings. Uh, uh, Donna's uh, group um, added that it should be the responsibility of everyone in the firm and the organization should be seen that way. The importance of figuring out how to make this everyone's individual responsibility and then echoing the point that was uh, just made by Christopher about uh, the importance of leadership to be part of the team and that it's seen as supported by top leadership. Aisha group Aisha's group added the importance of reviewing all training materials with a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens to impact change. And so not only having this as standalone conversations about racism and bias to better serve, serve clients, but have this be integrated into all training materials, which sounds like it's part of this idea of um, integration of diversity, equity, and inclusion into substantive training. Uh, there's Aisha's group also talked about prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion, and how do you do that? How do you create spaces for nonprofits and firms to have these conversations? Uh, Jess's group echoed my group around being intentional about creating this overlap between the two systems. And that means creating uh, really explicit opportunities with timeframes attached to hold firms accountable for creating this kind of overlap. And also now, especially creating spaces where people from the community can educate partners about where to focus pro bono efforts. And then again, uh, echoing these points, Lara's group 
echo the importance of buy-in from senior management and partners, uh, as well as from people at every level of the firm. We talked about the importance of creating safe spaces for people to know that they can take action or know where they can go if they have an issue. Um, and that could include uh, creating visible committees, committees at the firm. Uh, and finally, just the the refrain of education and the importance of education. And we're hearing a lot about this really across the board that we need to actually know our history, that we need to really understand, this is something Kevin raised, we need to understand how did we get to this place? Why are we here? What is the role and responsibility of law firms in both understanding that history in developing the capacity to have these hard conversations and taking this up in a really intentional way that's not only the the fad of the moment, uh, but will also uh, be something that gets built into the structure of law firms. Uh, and to do that when the incentive structures and the culture might actually be pushing against that. So how is this going to be done in a way that really engages with these kind of structural and cultural issues in the firm? Let me just ask our panelists uh, if you, if, uh, if, if people would wanna have like really uh, 30 seconds to a minute and starting with Christopher, if we can hopefully hear you uh, since uh, <laughs> uh, you should really have the opportunity to speak, but just to say any last minute thoughts you wanna leave with, um, leave with, with with the participants? Uh, just two things. One, I think I, I agree with most of everything that's been said here, um, but I do believe that law firms are unique institutions and unless you get um, the support of the, the folks that run the firm for these programs and these approaches, it's gonna be challenging. And secondly, the other way to counteract that in terms is, to, is education. I think if you have robust sort of programming that looks at issues of unconscious bias or racial justice issues. I think that that because that helps people understand what the issues are from various sort of constituents within the firm. Um, Annie and Aisha, do you want to uh, your 30 seconds minute final thoughts? Sure. Um, so we're sharing final thoughts now. So I will begin and then I will um, ask Annie to jump in. Um, final thoughts are just that if um, communication is so important, I think that we undervalue it, right? Um, being able to communicate across departments and um, with leadership is critical and crucial. And so opening up the lines of communication and everyone thinking of, of themselves as an advocate for diversity and inclusion will be greatly beneficial. And um, final last words on this is, are that for institutions where, um, like law firms, that see that a certain population of people are attracted to pro bono, think of this as a strategic opportunity to meet their needs, their goals, and also their career development and engagement. Great. Um, Annie, uh, 30 seconds. Hi, and just, uh, you know, echoing everything that Aisha says, that, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this panel, I strongly believe that this, you know, the continuous and consistent conversations with our diversity and inclusion um, team is really um, valuable um, and encourage others at other firms where departments are siloed to absolutely reach out to your DNI folks and attend meetings, set meetings, invite them um, to learn what it is you're doing in your space. Um, and you know, the, there are lots of benefits to be reaped from that. Kevin? Sure, I'm only gonna take 20 seconds, Susan. Um, thank you. I wanna thank Vols for, for, for hosting this. It's been fantastic. I'm sure I've learned more than I've contributed. And I wanna thank Thompson Reuters and APCO and the other sponsors. My message for everyone who participated today is do not underestimate your ability to effectuate change. Do not take it for granted. You took the time to participate today. Maybe you come away with a couple of things that nuts and bolts that you can bring back to your firm. Use them. Don't underestimate your role. If you do, everyone else will. So go out there and do some protesting within your firm. And if, when you do it, and when you're a voice for diversity and inclusion, when you're a voice for pro bono, 
I can guarantee you that you will also advance your career interests because you're being a leader, you're being smart, you're being innovative, and you'll be appreciated. So go out and do it. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing all of these insights. Thank you to Vols uh, and uh, to all of the planners of the of the workshop and.